Thank you for joining me uh, today. I'm uh, Chip Kent, the Chief Data Scientist at Deephaven Data Labs, and we're going to talk about uh, real-time data science made easy. So to start, uh, I'll give you a little background on uh, you know my history and things that shape my thinking. Uh, way back in the day, I did uh, scientific computing work, and then went on to do uh, high performance computing environments and then uh, spent quite a while as a uh, uh, doing quantitative finance on Wall Street uh, looking at uh, trading signals uh, things of uh, you know milliseconds up to in the long end a couple of days um, all real-time things and then uh, you know, we took uh, technology developed there and uh, spun that out as uh, Deephaven Data Labs where I'm the chief data scientist so uh, real-time data science made easy. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the scope of this talk. So first of all, we're gonna talk about real-time, we're gonna talk about data science, we're gonna talk about uh, production quality, so things that actually work. Um, then we're gonna talk about uh, things that are easy for data scientists to use. Uh, there's a quick path to production. Uh, there are flexible systems uh, using leading, leading open technologies and they're cases that work with structured and semi-structured data, since those are the, uh, the most common uh, use cases. Uh, we're not going to talk about um, software technologies that are difficult for data scientists to use. Uh, we're not gonna talk about the many technologies out there without traction. We're not gonna talk about legacy tech, and uh, we're not gonna talk about tech that requires major computer science investment. Uh, you know, We want things that are easy to set up, easy to use, um, and we don't want to look at technologies that require a, a lot of labor to get going. So with that, uh, let's look at uh, what we're going to talk about. So first we're going to discuss uh, why real time, then what is data science and engineering, uh, then uh, real time versus static, uh, then smart real time query engines, what are those? And uh, Next, uh, using static libraries for real-time. Finally, building real-time data science systems and then uh, design patterns to use when constructing uh, your own system. So first, uh, why real-time? So by 2025, analysts estimate that 30% of generated data will be real-time data. This is uh, 52 zettabytes of real-time data per year and is roughly the amount of total data produced in 2020. This is an enormous amount of data. So soon, almost every data scientist and data engineer will be working with real-time data in one form or another. You know, this could be data from finance, it could be e-commerce, could be Internet of Things, could be medical, could be computer security, or industrial, you know, even transportation. Metaverse, you know, the, the future of data science is real time. So what do data scientists and data engineers do? It's an important question to ask uh, as we look at real time. So um, as a group, we do data loading, data transformation, data cleaning, data pipelines, data curation, data exploration, data analysis, predictive model development, visualization, report generation, and we create uh, proofs of concept. Um, and as we move into real time, we need to do each and every one of these things in real time. So what is real time versus static? So if we look at, uh, in this case, a table of data, um, to go from the table and static in the static world to a real-time table, the data can change. Uh, you know, simple concept. And this, these changes can be repeated over and over and over as uh, new data comes in. So if we go just from real-time data to real-time data science, what does that mean? So we have a table. We may want to perform some sort of, sort of uh, computation on it. And then as we get a, uh, more data coming in, uh, we can perform another calculation on it. Um, treating the data this way can be very inefficient um, if you're recomputing everything. And so that 
uh, brings us to uh, smart query engines for real time. So you know, in real time, you know, we have this changing data. And if you have a smart query engine, instead of uh, looking at entire snapshots of data, you can look at changes in data and then incre incrementally update calculations based on these changes. So if we look at this table here, uh, we have row additions. We also have cell modifications and we can have row deletions and you can have re-indexing and re-indexing may be a little unfamiliar uh, but the concept is the you know the data didn't change but the order of the data in the table may have changed so let's look at a case to kind of reinforce why computing on changes is important so let's say you have a table uh, like this one on the left that may be a billion rows long and we add one new row. Really, you don't want to recompute the entire table uh, just because one new row is added. Why not just recompute the row? And you can come up with many, many, many examples like this, but it is universally true that computing on the changes ends up being much more efficient than recomputing on the entire table. So, you know, can't I just use my favorite static library? You know, whether it's NumPy or Pandas or TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch, whatever. Um, you, you know, can't I just use that in real-time data? And the answer is, well, maybe. So there are a few cases uh, where it would make sense. So first case, uh, your data is really small. Um, in this case, if your data is small enough and, uh, you know, you can recompute everything uh, every time the data changes, and that ends up being okay. Uh, you know, th there are problems like this. Um, you know, but if your data ticks quickly or changes often or is very large, uh, this just doesn't work. Second case, um, you know, we can take snapshots of that of the data. So. Occasionally, a snapshot of the real-time world is, is grabbed and then computations happen on that snapshot. Um, you know, this gets around problems of uh, keeping up with data changes, but uh, with, with very frequent data changes, but at the same time, um, it's somewhat compromised because you don't uh, see ev everything that is changing in the data, and that could potentially be a problem. The third way you can use uh, your static libraries is integrating uh, with a smart query engine. In this case, the smart query engine is, uh, is taking care of these table changes and you can, incorporate, you can integrate into the query engine so that when these calculations on changes happen, uh, it, it's using uh, your, your static library. So now uh, let's look at uh, building real-time data science systems. So um, open real-time data software is like Legos. You can think about each Lego performing a specific uh, job and to create a real-time data science system you need to grab um, Legos that perform different jobs and stick them together. For example, you may have a KSQL DB query engine and a Deephaven query engine hooked to a Red Panda data backbone with, uh, you know, a uh, with gRPC for communication. Um, so the uh, when, when, you're, when you're building a system, you have two key questions. First of all, what does my system need to do? And second of all, to accomplish that, uh, which Legos do I need? So the Legos for building real-time data science systems look like this. First, uh, you need a way to get data in. You need a way to get data out. You need a layer for communication. You 
um, in many cases want to persist uh, histories so that they can be used later. Um, you need a query engine to do some computing and frequently you have clients and these clients can be user interfaces, they can be plotting, they can be visualization, they can be dashboards, they can be other systems. So the, the first layer to talk about is, uh, you know, where real-time data moves and lives. So in this layer, um, you, there, there are two key pieces. The first piece is your communication layer, and the communication layer lets different parts of your real-time system talk to each other. The second key piece in, the in, the, uh, in this layer is the persistent storage, which allows you to store data um, for use or for use in other components. So in this world, um, Kafka is a key component. So in the, in the old static world, um, you, you tended to have systems built around SQL databases. And the SQL databases would uh, get updates when new data came in, or they would get deletions when data was removed. Um, but Kafka serves a similar purpose in the uh, real-time world. So in this case, everything in the real-time world, um, everything gets recorded as Kafka events. And so Kafka is going to provide both your communication and your storage. Um, then a recent alternative to Kafka is Red Panda. And so Red Panda is a re-implementation of Kafka in C++. And what that means is anytime you use Kafka, you could use Red Panda because their interfaces are the same, but you can expect Red Panda is typically going to be faster. One other set of changes Red Panda has made um, are designed to make um, administering uh, the software easier. So in general, you should find Red, Red Panda easy to, easier to administer than something like Kafka. Um, another communication technology uh, that you may be less familiar with is Barrage. Um, so if you look at Kafka or Red Panda, those are both uh, designed around the, the concept of streaming. So you just keep getting uh, new data as streams. Uh, Barrage is kind of a different concept. Barrage is meant to um, communicate tables of data and, and including the changes. And so, you know, if you look at what we discussed earlier, these changes can be adds, modifies, deletes, and re-indexes. And so uh, Barrage takes, um, you know, Aeroflight, which is a common uh, memory format for tables of data and extends it to uh, real time and allows those uh, real-time tables to be communicated. Uh, because Arrow is a, uh, a memory format for real-time tables, um, it is portable between different programming languages, and so that helps you as you build tools on top of it. Uh, now, uh, let's look at uh, query engines. And query engines are where data science happens. So, First of all, um, what is a query engine? So, a, so first, a uh, query engine takes data in and then it uh, performs operations on it. These operations could be filters, they can be joining, they can be aggregating, transforming, it can be math, AI, computation. And then uh, after performing these, really data science calculations, the query engine has a way to output the data. So you can think about um, the query engine as being the, uh, you know, the, the brains um, in your data science pipeline. Um, and, you know, the, the brain is what's doing the data science. So a key question um, with the query engine is what is the query language? And these query languages uh, tend to break down into two primary categories. The first category is SQL. So 
SQL is a common uh, programming language. Many, many people are familiar with it. It's been around for years. Um, it is good if your use cases are fairly simple, but as your use cases and your data science get more complex, it can be problematic. Um, SQL's integration with Python tends to be quite shallow, and SQL generally has little or no time series support. The second category of query languages I'm going to call uh, data frame languages. And these are things that are you know, analogous to you know, working with a data frame in uh, Pandas or in R. And so these are something new to learn. They're not something old like SQL. They tend to be very flexible. They have deep integrations with Python and they uh, support time series. So if, you, if you're looking for a SQL type language, something like KSQL DB or Materializer Spark um, or query engines that support this, if you're looking for a data frame type language, uh, Deephaven and Spark uh, would support that. So let's look uh, a little more at, at what these uh, query languages look like and the implications. So if you have a simple query uh, like this one here, we take a a page views table and we uh, perform a filter on it where we filter uh, timestamps within a range. Um, on the top you can see a deep haven query which is a, uh, a data frame type query and you know it's very readable. On the bottom you can see a the analogous SQL query. Again it's very readable. And if you're doing these simple things either SQL or data frame languages uh, end up working out very well. Um, if you go to complex queries, uh, you know you see more differences. So in this query here, uh, two real-time uh, tables are first of all joined using a time series join. Uh, then uh, a new column is added, and that column is computed uh, using a Python function. And then a subset of those columns are retained. The table is grouped based on a column a new ta uh, a, a new column is added uh, and computed from a formula and then that table is ungrouped uh, so you know you, you can see with this uh, uh, data frame type language that's fairly easy um, doing that in SQL is likely a nightmare um, and it's not something I'd want to do so you know as you're uh, you, you're considering um, a query engine, think very carefully about the query language and the types of problems you're going to be solving. So the uh, first query engine we'll talk about is KSQL DB. Um, this is just SQL for Kafka, fairly straightforward. So as you'd expect, the query language is SQL. Um, there's a command line where you can interactively work with data, uh, but you know it doesn't provide visualization and the time series queries are very limited uh, basically to things like uh, windows of data. Um, another query engine is Materialize. This is uh, SQL for Kafka with consistency guarantees. So again, your query language is SQL. There's an interactive command line. Um, there's no visualization and no time series queries. Uh, now we can move to something uh, like Spark Streaming. So S Spark Streaming is, as you might guess, Spark for streaming data. And it is an evolution of Spark. Um, so uh, with Spark Streaming, uh, streams of data are broken up into smaller batches. And then these uh, batches, uh, you, you, you can use the the uh, you know uh, the basically the the Spark compute engine to operate on these batches of data. So this is good and bad. On the good side, you get the power of the the Spark uh, compute engine. Um, on the bad side, um, you know this was basically a new requirement that was added late in the Spark development cycle, and you end up with typical problems where uh, requirements are added late in a software project. Um, it's not what you would uh, 
design if you you started from scratch um, with uh, real-time streaming requirements. So um, if we look at the query, query languages uh, for Spark's uh, streaming, it supports both SQL and data frames, which is great. You can pick the, the particular language based on your problem. Um, the, uh, there, there's a, uh, an inter interactive command line um, for interacting with data. Um, visualization, I'm actually not sure what's available for the streaming side. Spark, uh, on static data, there is visualization, but there is little to no documentation for uh, creating visualization on streaming data with Spark. Um, and Spark does have uh, time series queries, which is fantastic. Um, and the uh, last query engine we'll talk about is Deephaven. Uh, so Deephaven Community Core uh, was born in the quant finance world. Um, you can perform very complex queries. Uh, you, you know, it is very good at interacting with data. Uh, there's plotting and visualization to go with that, and it was designed for high performance. So Deephaven is uh, uh, the uh, query engine that is uh, behind that is operating in the background of uh, many of the world's largest hedge funds, banks, and exchanges. Um, the, the query language is data frame based. There's an interactive command line. Uh, you get an IDE for visualization while you're working with data, and you have the ability to do uh, advanced time series queries. So just to kind of show you what a real-time uh, interactive environment looks like. Uh, you can see here uh, you have uh, an interactive command line, you have your code you're working with, you can see your real-time tables as they're changing, you can also see uh, real-time plots, and you can interact with these plots. And uh, you know this ends up being a, a good thing for touching and feeling the data. So let's go on to uh, design patterns. So a software design pattern is a general reusable solution to a commonly occurring problem within a given context in software design. Um, and what that means for you know, real-time data science, you know, we're going to look at common ways of selecting Legos and assembling them so that you can create a real-time data science system that works uh, without having to reinvent things. So the first pattern we'll look at is a, an as simple as possible uh, case. So there's no data backbone and we have no persistence. So in this case, you have a way to get data in, you have a query engine, a way to get data out, and then you can have clients for plotting, visualization, dashboards, and things like that. And uh, this example was done with Deephaven because it's one of the few query engines that can, can operate without um, infrastructure for a data backbone. So um, here I'm going to show you how simple it can be. Uh, start just with a pip install uh, of a Python library for Deephaven. And this will take a few seconds. Okay, now we're going to, uh, we have a script uh, that will start Deephaven and perform a query. We will run this script from the command line. And now that the script is up, switch to a web browser with the uh, uh, real-time data science environment. Um, you know, in just a few seconds, you can be up and playing with real-time data science. And as simple as possible, that's very easy. Now let's go to the second uh, pattern that's a little more complicated. In this case, uh, we have a data backbone, we're going to have persistence, and we're going to have a query engine. So here, <clears throat> your communication backbone would be Kafka or Red Panda, and we would hook a query engine to it. This query engine could be Deephaven, KSQL DB, Materialize, Spark, um, any of these are fine. And the way this would work is the query engine would read data in from Kafka, perform its calculations, get its outputs, and then those outputs would be sent right back into Kafka. You know, simple idea. Now we can uh, take that design pattern two, 
and make it a little more complicated. In this case, we have the data backbone, we have persistence, but instead of having one query engine, we'll have multiple query engines. So each of these query engines, like before, talks to Kafka, it reads data from Kafka as inputs, does its calculations, it sends uh, the outputs back to Kafka as new topics. So um, in this case, you can think of these query engines as being like microservices. Um, each one is dedicated to uh, you know, a particular real-time uh, calculation. And you know, there, there's no requirement that the query engines be the same. So for example, you could have a deep haven query engine and a materialized query engine, and potentially a third query engine, which is a Spark query engine, and they could all work with each other and talk to each other because they're going through the same uh, Kafka backbone. Uh, anyway, it's a very nice design pattern, and you can scale things up as you add new queries, and you can match the query engine to your particular problem. Okay, uh, design pattern four is a client to the query engine. So in this case, you have a query engine that's up and running. Uh, it could be any of these uh, cases we discussed. And then you have a client application uh, that talks to the query engine. The client application could be Python, C++, Java, JavaScript, Go. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, all that matters is that the query engine supports the client for the language you care about. So in this case, the client can subscribe to outputs from the query engine and uh, then get the data and do things to it. A client could also potentially perform calculations and then send uh, results back into the query engine. Uh, these clients could be other real-time systems. They could be user interfaces. Uh, really, it, it is quite flexible. Okay. Uh, Fifth pattern is Jupyter. Uh, you know, Jupyter is a key tool in the data science world. It is a way for uh, you know, trying out new ideas. It is also a way to combine text with calculations to communicate ideas. Uh, and it is essential in the, the workflows of most data scientists. So in pattern five, we are going to look at Jupyter in the simplest case. We're going to have no bat data backbone no persistence, and we're going to embed the query engine directly into Jupyter. So that would look like this. So you have Jupyter, you have the query engine running inside Jupyter, and then you have your clients running inside Jupyter. And in, in this case, your clients are the uh, GUI widgets that are going to display uh, you know, uh, tables, plots, uh, and other, uh, other real-time data. So we can look at an example of that here. We have Jupyter. Uh, uh, did this example with Deephaven, but you could do this with uh, other query engines. As, uh, sorry, you can't do this with other query engines because this is the simple uh, embedded case. Uh, but you can say, see, uh, we've popped a real-time table up here uh, in a manner that's very similar to how you might see just a static uh, pandas table displayed. Uh, the next uh, more complicated case is we have Jupyter, uh, but we have a data backbone with persistence and we have a query engine attached to the backbone. <clears throat> so that case would look like this. Here you have Jupyter. Inside Jupyter you have a client and that client talks to your query engine which is communicating with your uh, Kafka Red Panda backbone. And if you have a large team environment with Kafka set up, uh, this is typically how you would do Jupyter. So in uh, summary, uh, let's, let's go through the, the key, key concepts I hope you remember. So first of all, open real-time uh, software is like Legos. Each Lego performs a particular task and to build your real-time data science system, you figure out which Legos you need and you hook them together. Next, uh, with real-time data, it is inefficient to totally recompute every time your data changes. Uh, you want to avoid that, and it is smarter to uh, compute based on changes in your data, and these changes can be adds, modifies, deletes, and re-indexes. Next, uh, when you're picking a query engine, 
uh, think very carefully about the query language uh, supported by the query engine and make sure it matches your use case. So you have SQL type cases uh, where you can use case SQL DB, materialize a spark, and then you have uh, uh, more expressive data frame type languages uh, supported by DeepHaven and Spark. Uh, finally, um, use established design patterns. Uh, you know, there are uh, a lot of work has gone into, you know, what are uh, robust Legos to use and how to assemble them to accomplish what you want. There's no sense in reinventing this. Uh, just get a design pattern that's been worked out and build from there. Uh, finally, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. You can uh, contact me after this at chipkit at deephaven.io uh, if there's something you'd like to ask me directly. Uh, also, the Deephaven community Slack uh, link is right here. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're getting into this field and you want to kind of talk about your uh, particular real-time data science problem and how you might build out a system, this is a great community that can uh, answer questions. Um, you know, a lot of experience there. Um, also, if you just want to uh, give, you know, kind of this real-time world a try, if you go to deephaven.io, uh, there's a button you can click to spin up uh, some hardware and get a demo system. And on in the demo environment, uh, there's some real-time data and some examples you can try. And I believe uh, Materialize has a uh, similar uh, environment if you're looking at, uh, you know, more of a SQL type query language. And with that, I am happy to take any questions. Thank you.